I like the the videos. I like the videos because you know you can always rewind it back and see it in slow motion. I'm doing alternate cover test. I'm increasing the prism. Now there is ISO, so we have overcorrected it. Now I will go back. I will reduce the prism. See, yeah. So we'll come back here. Yeah. Now at this point of time, we are seeing that there is a small exo. So we increase prism by one step. So that is the amount of neutralization we have neutralized the deviation once we increase the prism beyond the point of neutralization it is point of reversal which means that i which was coming from out to in will start coming from in to out we would normally operate for point of neutralization not for point of reversal then you always go back to other eye you measured fixing right eye now right now you are measuring fixing right eye we had already measured fixing left eye so the if the prism is in front of left eye then the measurement that you are getting is fixing right eye if the prism is in front of right eye then you are measuring fixing left eye lot of times teachers would ask you how do you how do you know whether it is fixing right eye or fixing left eye jahan pe prism hai uska other eye is the fixing eye and that particular eye is the center and that particular eye is defining the deviation of other eye then there is krimsky's test see this was a very you know mother mother is holding her, his ears he bahut sharati bachcha is there he is having partially accommodative isotropia now you can see that he has isotropia and his left eye is amblyopic left eye is not holding any fixation the moment you uncover the right eye left eye goes inside now even after giving him plus 6.5 diopter sphere he still has some amount of deviation which is left this is known as partially accommodative isotropia now patient is having isotropia we did cycloplegic refraction we gave him maximum amount of glasses which is 6.5 despite giving 6.5 he still has some amount of isotropia remaining that is partially accommodative because partly it has got treated with glasses and some part is still remaining so we would what we will do is we will do a modified krimsky by keeping prisms in front of right eye because we want to measure his left eye we would keep prisms in front of his fixing eye that is right eye once we put the prism in front of right eye it induces a corresponding corrective movement in the non fixing eye which is much easier to judge rather than to put prisms in front of non fixing eye so now you see we will start putting prisms in front of right eye left eye will gradually come in the center i am increasing the prism in right eye you keep on yeah see now left eye is in the center you just see this clip uh, you just see now i have i've just revised re, uh, yeah now you see the left eye left eye is inside increase the prism right eye see now it is coming in the center now it is absolutely in the center see left eye is in the center so that is how you bring in Krim, this is what you do in krimsky's test this is what is krimsky's test you put prisms of increasing power in front of right eye in such a way that the reflex comes in the center in the non fixing eye then we come to the ocular movements this is duction what you are seeing here this is duction when you cover one eye you see adduction abduction supraduction infraduction and when you see them together it is levoversion dextroversion elevation depression circumduction levosubduction so when he looks on the left side it is levoversion when he looks on the right side it is dextroversion so as simple as that and then there are convergences and divergences so that is disconjugate and conjugate movement so there is another uh, you know lot of times i am asked because this is a constant problem with most of uh, our teaching that you know we we don't teach how to measure fusional amplitudes now this, this is very very this is very important because you know lot of times you get people for fitness you get people for fitness to measure their convergence amplitudes you to measure their divergence amplitudes and it is very difficult to to remember how to measure it's very easy actually just that you know we we don't get a lot of patients now this particular patient is actually has no deviation and he has fusion 
when he has fusion, you can measure his fusion by synaptophore or by prisms. By prisms, when you measure, you are measuring in free space, so it is more physiological. So how do you measure convergence? You start putting base out prism in front of one of his eyes till the point he starts seeing double or one of his eyes deviate. So when you put a base out prism, basically what you are doing, you are trying to move his eye outward and he has to converge. He has to converge back to overcome that amount of prism so that he can converge. So you put base out prisms for convergence and base in prisms for divergence. Once you once you reach to a point where he uh, you know where he starts seeing double, then you have to reduce it. So that is the breaking point. This is how you have to you have to notify it. You can see it in the video. What I have done is I have just done alternate cover test and then I won't do alternate cover test. I would just gradually see his right eye. It keeps on coming inside. See, the moment I increase the prism, uh, nah, yeah. now I'll do a quick, uh, I'll give him a commutative target, I'll do a quick cover test just to tell him that right eye, left eye is different. Now I'm increasing the prism, you see right eye keeps on coming inside and left eye keeps on moving inside to, to keep on, to keep up, to uh, remove any diplopia and at this point of time, you would see that at, at one point of time, his left eye would simply deviate outside. He's no longer able to cope up the amount of base out prism that we are keeping. The prism bar has multiple prisms with increasing power. So this particular power, the point at which you see this outward movement, see this right eye has completely gone out. This is the breaking point. See left eye is now going out. Patient is trying to switch fix. He is trying to see with the left eye, see with the right eye, trying to fuse, trying to bring the eyes together, is not able to bring the eyes together. And that particular point is known as the breaking point. Then you remove one step, go down, and then you get the recovery point when the patient is able to recover. Now the difference between the two is actually the amount of, uh, you know, amount of sustenance that he has got. So, so now you reduce the prism and reduce it further. Till the point that he's, yeah, you reduce it further and now he's able to, now he, see, see, he's still doing switch. Now he's able to fuse. Now you can see with both eyes he's able to fuse. Now this is his point of recovery. So his, his breaking point is 35 prisms or 40 prisms and his recovery point is 25, which means that once his fusion is broken, he, he can only come back at 25 prisms. So how would you write it? That is also very, very important. How would you write it in your book? How will you write it for that patient? You will write that convergence amplitude for near, breaking point 40 prism diopter, recovery point 20 prism diopter, normal convergence amplitudes. I'm just giving a normative. 25 prism is breaking point and 20 prisms is recovery. For divergence amplitude, you will reverse this. But the divergence amplitude are very low. They are as low as 14 prisms or 12 prisms. So that is regarding uh, that is regarding the amplitude. Now we will now we'll see just one the, the same patient the same uh, chap who had partially accommodative visitor. You can see left eye when he when he moves the eyes in the dextro version. You can see the left eye upshoots. Now this is the difference between upshoot in Duane's retraction syndrome and infra oblique overaction. When there is an infra oblique overaction, the movement the moment child looks on the right side, the eye will go up because this is secondary to inferior oblique overaction. How it is different in DRS? The moment child looks on the side, the eye will not go up. The, if you give the eyes a little bit nudge, if you push your target slightly up, it will immediately go up in inferior oblique overaction or superior oblique overaction plus four. This will be plus two, plus three, whatever. So, when it is because of horizontal muscles, secondary to DRS, there is an upshoot. You can see that there will be a sudden upshoot. Whereas in this, you can see that there is mainly, see, this is hardly plus one infra oblique overaction. And then you can see the left eye, you see the left eye. The moment he looks on the right side, the left eye goes up. See, plus three infra oblique overaction is seen in the left eye. So this is infra oblique overaction. And how do you measure ocular motility? How do you measure ocular motility? So normally ocular motility is measured into uh, plus one, plus two, plus three, plus four. 
and minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, minus 4 with minus 4 being not able to move beyond midline and minus 1 being not able to touch uh, the limbus at the temporal part or the pupil at the punctum. So that is the normative in adduction and abduction. Whereas, uh, so there is a scale available that you can actually measure the amount of uh, excursions and these are the normative data which we found out in 2010 and this was by Kestenbaum way back, this was in 1955 when he published his article about normative data uh, for elevation, depression, abduction and, uh, you know, uh, adduction. So this was, uh, this was about ocular motility. We can take some questions on ocular motility or, or we can continue with the uh, examination of sensory status. Okay, so so we come to the to the second part, uh, which is uh, how, what do we do in examination of sensory status? So basically, sensory status tells us about uh, the problems or whether this was since birth, whether this has uh, acquired, if there is a diplopia, if there is presence of binocular vision, it means that you know it was not congenital; it it gradually developed at a later later time. And it also tells us whether uh, post-operatively patient may develop diplopia if patient has been at an at adult age, if it has got decompensated exotropia, the chances of uh, post-op diplopia, but if it is a congenital, uh, you know, if it is an infantile, so there is no congenital strabismus, but if it is an infantile strabismus, very early in age uh, patient has developed, then the chances of post-op diplopia are very low. Now this was this is something which they they love in exams and uh, you know o over a period of years I, I don't really uh, enjoy much with uh, grades of binocular vision. This was a early this was very early maybe in 50s when Claude Berth who was a, a French uh, strabismologist who said that you know you can actually grade binocular vision into simultaneous perception. Fusion and stereo based on the slides of major amblyoscope. He clearly defined that this is based on major amblyoscope or synaptophore as we now call it and not really in, uh, you know, real life. In real life, you do not grade binocular vision. It depends on how much monocular clues you have, how much, uh, you know, how much, uh, how much light is there, how much contrast is there. So how many monocular clues or binocular clues are there uh, that that makes sure about your perception of fusion or stereo acuity. So these grades are, although they are arbitrary, they serve a good purpose in, you know, in differentiating the amount of uh, binocular single vision that a patient has. So this, this is how you can measure it. So there are two prerequisites for any person having binocular single vision. One is that image should fall on corresponding retina and image should be Round about same size, approximately same size and shape, and uh, so this is uh, basically a theory thing. Uh, I, I won't be falling much into it, but fusion and stereopsis basically fusion means there are corresponding retina elements being stimulated. Motor system is required, and it is a two-dimensional thing because either it will be a horizontal fusion or it will be a vertical fusion. Whereas stereo activity is in the same panels area, but the retina elements are slightly disparate. And the disparate retinal elements is what gives stereo activity. If you go too far, if you're outside Panem's area, it has to be within the Panem's area. And if you go outside the horopter, there won't be any stereo activity. Motor system is not required in this, and it is indeed three-dimensional, and it is mainly horizontal because both the eyes are separated horizontally. They are not separated vertically. So stereo activity is almost always horizontal stereo activity. The moment you have vertical disparate uh, image separation, there is no stereo activity because we in humans cannot appreciate vertical stereopsis. Now fusion will function equally well for all fixation distances. Stereo activity, unfortunately, beyond 600 meters, there won't be stereo activity because you are outside Panem's area. There is no disparate separate, uh, you know, retinal points which are getting stimulated. Fusion may occur without stereopsis, but without fusion, it won't be possible to have any significant stereo activity. And stereo activity occurs only with horizontal disparity, whereas fusion, as I said, can be vertical or horizontal. Now, this is another uh, very uh, beautiful uh, picture taken from Van Noodle, uh, 
the patient has right eye esotropia with NRC. It is very important to define it here that patient has normal retinal correspondence and if both the fovea are stored, there would be confusion and if uh, you know, if fovea and extra foveal point is stimulated, there will be diplopia and this particular diplopia point is given same, but this image will be shown on this side, which means that if you have esotropia, the eye is crossed inside, but diplopia will be uncrossed because the element which is getting stimulated is nasal to fovea and it has a temporal perception and so patient will see it temporally and so there will be uncrossed diplopia in esotropia if there is uh, uh, NRC and confusion is very rare to perceive even when we want to perceive our brain does not let us perceive confusion because we know that a house can be on a tree but there can be two trees our brain can accept the fact that there can be two houses two trees uh, but it cannot accept that a house can be on a tree or a coffee mug can be on laptop. So it is very difficult for the brain to comprehend that you know uh, there can be confusion whereas diplopia is much uh, easy for brain to accept. Now both confusion and diplopia uh, they are uh, you know they are uh, they, they are relevant when there is a manifest deviation. Now there are two disposable uh, disposal mechanisms uh, with when you have any esotropia either you can have suppression and then it may lead to an amblyopia or there can be an abnormal retinal correspondence with eccentric fixation. Now this can occur only when you are young, only when there is visually immature children. Both eyes are open. It is a binocular disposal mechanism. Amblyopia unfortunately is monoocular where the whole pathway including the lateral geniculate body develops anatomical changes where in suppression you do not get any anatomical changes at the level of cortex or at the level of brain. So that is very very important to understand and we should not use these terms that he has suppression suppression is an active central inhibition of the disparate and confusing images in originating from the retina of the deviated eye when other eyes open. Whereas amblyopia is even when the other eye is closed, you still have poor vision. Secondary to long-standing suppression, that is a possibility. And secondary to changes which could be anatomical also. Whereas abnormal retinal correspondence means that the fovea of fixating eye normally has a common visual direction with fovea of other eye which is known as bifovial fixation but in ARC it develops an anomalous common visual direction with the peripheral retina or the extra foveal point of the deviated eye which could be nasal or temporal and it receives the same image. If there is a complete adaptation which means that if the angle of deviation is equal to the amount of uh, objective angle is equal to angle of anomaly and the subjective angle has become zero which means that if patient has five prisms esotropia and patient is able to see binocularly at five prisms itself then it is complete adaptation which has already taken place and it is known as harmonious ARC and if there is incomplete adaptation it would be between zero to five and then it will be known as an unharmonious ARC. Now I, I think harmonious ARC and unharmonious ARC are not very uh, you know they are easy to understand but they, you cannot understand it very quickly as much quickly as I am saying. So if there are any questions, we can take it right now or if you want me to take it afterwards, we can take it afterwards. Should I move on? Sir, at the end, maybe we'll have some questions from the So when we talk about test for sensory status, obviously, as you talk, as we saw about confusion and diplopia, Similarly, you have foveo parafoveal tests, which are diplopia based tests, which are red glass tests, Wertford dot test, Begolini, Megamendox rod, and foveo foveal tests, out of which mainly it is the after image test, which can be done now on a major amblyoscope or a haploscope or a um, what is major amblyoscope? Um, um, Sanoptophore. And foveo foveal test of cuppers, unfortunately, is not available. We had a small uh, last uh, this thing. 
at Civil Hospital Ahmedabad in 2001, but I don't think they have it now. So foveal foveal test of cuppers, we had seen it during our post graduation, but nowadays I don't think anybody does it. So we have got after image test, which is equally good. There is nothing wrong in that. Red glass or red filter test is a diplopia based test. So what you basically do is you put red filter in front of one of the fixating eye and patient is looking at the small light source and you tell the patient whether there is cross diplopia, uncrossed diplopia. So this is basically a diplopia test. So what happens is ESO will give uncrossed diplopia. EXO will give cross diplopia. If patient has tropia, he will see single light. Patient with tropia, if he sees single light, either there is ARC or there is suppression. Right? And then there is a very simple test which is known as Workford dot test. Now Workford dot test is see the seeming seeming beauty of the test is that it is such a simple test. It can be done for any distance. You don't need you don't really need the patient to have color vision. Even if it is a red green test, you don't need a color vision in this. You you really don't need a color vision. You just have to ask him how many dots pa patients can see. And this is uh, this is a Clement Clark work for dot test. And uh, so if the response is three dots, then the eye under the red glass is under suppression. This is how the response is. See, this is the, the most be the beautiful part of the test is the simplicity of this test. So if you put a green filter and I'm putting a green filter, I have recorded this video for the education purpose only. Now, if you put a green filter in front of work for dot test, this is what patient sees. The red dot completely goes away. And what happens is that patient will immediately tell you that he is able to see three dots. And you immediately know that if red was in front of right eye, then it is right eye suppression. Or whatever eye is under suppression. The moment you put a red filter, what happens when you put a red filter? Obviously, the green lights will go away. See the beauty of it? You can clearly see only two dots. Now, whether you are colorblind or not, you will still see two dots only. It doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. So there are some questions which normally people will ask why there are red blue glasses, whether colorblind people can do it or not. These are all fancy questions. But, the, but my point is that, you know, this is the this is one of the best tests apart from Begolini's test. And if you have these two tests, this is this is sufficient for your prior or for your, uh, you know, for your uh, tourismus practice. You just need these two tests. Second thing is Begolini. Now Begolini is again very simple. 45 degrees, 135 degrees. If patient is able to see that, if a patient is able to see the cross, what you what you do is he is having binocular vision. If he is able to see only one line, then other eye is suppressed. Which line is able to see depends on which particular eye is not suppressed. If we see the central scotoma, it is central suppression scotoma. It's very very simple. This is a very simple test. Why Begolini is better than Worthford dot test? Because Workford dot test is based on red and blue, red and green glass. So it has to dissociate the two eyes. So the dissociation is very minimal with Begolin. We can see through the glass. So you can judge the position of the eye also, whether the patient is able to fix properly or not. You can measure cyclotropia with Begolini glasses and Begolini is more physiological at the end of the day. So both the tests are wonderful tests. And uh, I, I would say that these two tests are very, very easy to understand. Why it is at 45 and 135 degrees? Because these are the last uh, angles to go under suppression. That is what theoretically they say. Medox rod, again, very beautiful test. You just need a medox rod which changes the focus of light into a streak of light. No horizontal phoria. Exophoria means cross diplopia. Esophoria means uncross diplopia. Medox wing, now not many people use it, but you see the beauty of the test, how they have devised it. So what they have done is for ESO, once they give a uh, medox wing, they will ask the patient where the arrow is. If the arrow says any odd number, it is esophoria. If the arrow says any even number, it is exophoria. See the, see the simplicity. And then they will ask where the red arrow is. If there is even, it is right hyper. If it is, if it is even, it is left hyper. If it is odd, it is right hyper. Pure and simple. So such a simplicity, such a simple test. Now we come to foveal foveal test, which is haploscopic test. Haploscopic test, all the other tests you just leave, you just have to see after image test. So what is after image test? Basically you stimulate the eye of one, uh, fovea of one eye with a vertical stimulus and fovea of other eye with a horizontal stimulus. Now if there is ARC, this is the fovea foveal test. So you will see 
cross diplopia and esotropia uncross diplopia for exotropia why because it is a fovea fovea has the same visual direction well if the eye goes inside it will still project it on the same side so we are doing fovea foveal test and just a small point on arc there is an objective angle subjective angle and angle of anomaly is objective minus subjective so what is subjective angle subjective angle is the angle with which you can see the patient objective angle and angle of anomaly objective angle the angle at which patient sees binocularly so if the angle of anomaly is equal to objective angle which means subjective angle is zero it is harmonious arc because the angle at which patient presents to you if he is having binocularly at that particular angle then he is having complete adaptation and it is harmonious arc yeah so then there are few tests this is this is very very basic test these are titmus fly test which are based on polaroid glasses principle uh, you in this you just have to remember that circles will give you up to 40 seconds of arc then there is lang stereo acuity tno tno gives you up to 15 seconds of arc lang will give you up to 200 seconds of arc and again the most uh, most physiological and most authentic is frisbee stereo acuity which gives you up to 15 seconds of arc and then last is lang's two principle two pencil test so if you don't have a stereo acuity test you can just take two pencils give it to the patient right hand left hand tell the patient to take two pencils and put them together vertically or horizontally and if he is able to do it with both eyes open it means that patient has cross stereo acuity and this test you can use even if you don't have any other stereo acuity test whether you have langs or whether you do not have uh, frisbee you can still use this test to find out a uh, a basic a cross stereo acuity test so that was all regarding uh, you know stereo acuity uh, and that was all regarding evaluation of